seated, as you're seated, I want to uh, summarize, and you go back to Genesis 10, and we're going to cover all 32 verses, uh, even if I have to go at 78 speed, okay? Do you remember when you were little? Some of you aren't old enough, but when I was little, they used to have those 16 and a halfs, and I don't know, 33s, and then 45s, and then 78s, or maybe there's something else in between. And I used to always love to crank it up to 78 and have it really go fast, you know, and got the song over quick, okay? That's what I'm going to do with chapter 10. But I hope, and if you have a pen, I hope you'll get it and mark, because chapter 10 will never be the same once you see some of the patterns that are in there. But if I could summarize all of the Bible up through chapter 10, it would be this, that God created Adam and Eve, Adam and from Adam Eve. They had two sons. The two sons became two lines, two families of peoples, Cain's family of those who did not seek the Lord and Abel's family of those who did seek the Lord. Abel was cut off, murdered by his brother, so he was replaced. And Cain uh, had another brother, Seth, who became the father of the godly line. And so those two lines go on until their culmination when the last descendant of Cain and the last descendant of Seth are on this planet and the last descendant of Seth as far as a patriarch, was Noah. And God takes Noah and his wife into the ark, and they have now three sons. And so God starts over again with another couple. As Adam and Eve started the earth to the flood, God starts over again with another couple, Noah. And Noah's three sons start three more lines or families of people. And we'll see that they basically are the three groupings of the different civilizations in the eras that they have risen up. But in those three lines, God especially chose for his covenant purposes one group, Shem. Remember Shem, Ham, Japheth. Shem, the Semitic people. In fact, the the Bible was written, the two-thirds of it at least, in a Semitic language. The descendants of Shem are the Jews. And many other people, the Arabs, are too, uh, by and large. But God chose one line, the Semitic line, and from that... He kept on in that line till he came to one man, who we're going to get to next time, whose name was Abraham. And from that man, who had two sons, he picked, again, one son, Isaac, the son of promise. And through that one son of promise, he, again, had two sons, and he diverges, again, down another line to a son of promise, Jacob. And from that, there are 12 sons of Jacob, and he picks one, again, which is Judah. And then God zeroes down that line. There's no more breaking in the line, and it goes all the way down through David to Jesus Christ. But Jesus Christ opens up the blessing to all the sons of Noah, a potential of salvation to all. Because in the seed of Abraham, through Isaac, Jacob, and Judah, to Jesus Christ, all the nations of the earth would be blessed. It's a very beautiful picture of God's sovereignty. Well, let's look at it. Genesis 10, as far as the early nations are concerned, tells us there are three major groups of nations that naturally stem from the three sons of Noah. This chapter lists 70 nations, and it extends to some time soon after the scattering of the people from the Tower of Babylon. We're going to see that supernatural event next time. In general, this is what the table shows. From verses 2 to 5, the Japhetic, or the descendants of Japheth. Now, some of this is going to amaze you, uh, how, how Japheth shows up all the way around the cultures we're aware of, our Western cultures. And, and, and it amazes me when you study all this. Secondly, starting in verse 6, uh, by the way, Japheth's descendants migrated to Europe, and so that would be where many of our backgrounds would come from. Those of Ham... Uh, went southward into Africa. That's verses 6 through 20. And then those of Shem, from verses 22 to 32, remained in Western Asia. Now, there was a lot of migration. Remember, uh, next time we'll see this, because of immediately after the flood, there were the Ice Ages, there was a, a coming down of uh, an approaching and encroaching sheet of ice that Job saw. Job describes it. He says he saw the waters frozen hard like rock, and he saw the the treasuries of the frost. He saw this ice age, and so the people would retreat away from that, and the southern uh, civilizations advanced more rapidly at first than the northern because of the climate and all the hardships and everything else. But 
All of that's reflected. Although it's not certain, it seems probably the Far East was later settled by some of the Hamitic tribes and some of the Japhitic uh, nations. In other words, some of the Europeans swung over the top and, and uh, went into uh, the Orient area, and some of the Hamitic tribes went across the south and also did that. And you can see that in some of the migrations. Well, what are the origins of the nations? Well, the Bible clearly teaches in the 10th chapter of Genesis that all present nations, tribes, and languages have been derived from Noah's three sons and his three daughter-in-laws in a very few thousand years. In fact, uh, yesterday at sunset was the beginning of year 5762 for the Jewish people. They mark New Year's on Friday night of last week to Saturday night or Saturday sunset, and that's their new year, and it was year 5762. So they say that 5,762 years ago, God created the earth. They count, they count from creation, the Jews. They say, hey, it's our God that made the world. We're counting from the beginning. And so they say we're in year 5762, which is interesting uh, for them to, to come up. I'm not sure how they got that number. But in those few thousand years, uh, approximately uh, 4,000 plus since the Great Flood, all the different groupings of people have come from the three families that got off the boat with Noah. However, it might be questioned whether some extreme variations in the physical and linguistic characteristics could develop so rapidly. It's because at the Tower of Babel, there was a, and we'll see this next time, there was a forced isolation. God supernaturally, it seems that everyone spoke the same language until Babel. And that language was what Noah and his sons were speaking. And they, they seemed to have clustered initially around the area of Babel, but then God supernaturally isolated them in language groups. They could not marry outside of their language groups very easily because they couldn't understand each other. And so they began to migrate off in language groups. And it's interesting when computer models, recently the um, USA Today uh, published a study that when you take a computer and you do linguistic and philological studies and try and, and go backward in, in the study of the, of the probabilities of where words come from, it shows that all the languages seem to link back together into, of all things, a Mesopotamian, which would be the Tower of Babel type of setting. So it's another time that science kind of backs its way into the Bible. But here's what's really interesting for us. Several major European royal genealogies, which are found in the archives of the major European nations. If you go there and if you study as one man, Dr. Bill Cooper did, he did his doctorate and became an archivist and going as a historical student and went into their archives and this is what he found. He found that several European royal genealogies traced all the way back to Noah's son Japheth and to the list we're going to read tonight with no knowledge of the Bible with no trying to, to reckon. I mean, some of those archives, they don't even acknowledge the Bible in those countries, but they actually, in their records, go back. And so this is another evidence that points us who love God's word back to the fact that true ancient history always will correspond with the Bible because the Bible is God's inerrant word. And as I said, uh, Dr. Bill Cooper of Middlesex, England, in 1995, after spending 30 years writing his dissertation from 1965 to 1995, wrote his dissertation and published it. It's called After the Flood, and it's a genealogical record of 30 years study. And he compiled it through extensive research, and all of his notes going back to Shem, Ham, and Japheth, you can find in the archives of the national libraries from Britain across to Germany. Fascinating. Well, let me read to you uh, the conclusion of his dissertation. It's quite boring, if you ask me, but this is his conclusion. When I applied the table of nations, that's chapter 10 of Genesis, uh, to the healthy historical research of the various nations and their libraries, surprisingly, in light of what most commentaries go to such great lengths to assure us, namely that Genesis is not to be trusted as accurate history, was false. Now, what is he saying by that? Well, if you read most commentaries on the Bible, I'm talking about uh, you know, these scholarly commentaries, if you look up Genesis 10, 
What they say is that it's not a, an accurate historical record of the nations. It's rather kind of biblical Jewish kind of uh, uh, symbolism or something, and you can't trust it. But he took, and, and his premise was, he took the 70 con- nations that are listed in this 10th chapter, and he went and, and went to the National Libraries of Europe to study Japheth, and he found Japheth and all of his sons recorded in their records of especially the Roman conquest. When the Roman Empire came up to, to conquer the, the barbarians, they found nations named after what we're going to see here. Just amazing. So over the years, little by little, his testimony and his dissertation is, the pieces came together as he looked at the libraries of Europe, the Middle East, the Mesopotamian records, the Arabian records, the Egyptian records, the records in Turkey, and even he studied in Greece. And this picture build up that revealed the 10th and also the last part of the 11th chapter of Genesis, and here's his conclusion, to be an astonishingly accurate record of the families and tribes of mankind. Isn't that amazing? And he, of course, got his doctorate and he published it. Well,